It actually said spacecraft assembly facility. Like it says, that's what we do. This is where we assemble all of our big giant spacecraft. Now, the room we're looking at right now, this is called high bay number one. And high bay number one, like it implies there's a high bay number two. It's on the opposite side of the building. It's a little bit taller, but not quite as wide as this room. These two high bays are actually the two largest clean rooms we have here at JPL. And for those that don't know, a clean room is a special type of laboratory where the air quality is actually controlled. So the air inside that room is way, way, way cleaner than the air we're currently breathing right now. We also regulate the temperature and we also regulate the humidity, how much moisture there is in the air. Now, um, this particular clean room we're looking at right now, this is high bay number one. And this is actually where we built all of our um, rovers. So uh, if you remember in the video we saw Curiosity, the rover landed on Mars three years ago. It was built in this very room that you're looking at right now. Um, all the other rovers, you may uh, remember Spirit, Opportunity, uh, Sojourner, all of them were built in this very room you're looking at. The room next door, which is taller I mentioned, and, um, uh, several uh, stories taller than this one, that's where they built all the tall things. So things like Cassini, uh, that's the spacecraft you heard about in the video, went to Saturn. Um, the real spacecraft is uh, close to three and a half stories tall, so that was built in the clean room next door. Uh, we also built a Galileo over there, that's another big spacecraft, close to about two and a half stories tall, so that was built next door. Now, this uh, uh, clean room, the last really big spacecraft we built in here, was actually something referred to as SMAP, S-M-A-P. It's uh, the Soil Moisture Active Passive. You may have heard about a spacecraft, JPL, launched from here in California um, uh, earlier this year. If you did, most likely that's the spacecraft you heard about. This is an Earth-orbiting satellite that studies the fresh water on our planet. If you look on the far side of the wall, you'll no notice there's mission emblems all along the back side of the wall. They represent all the different missions we have built in this very clean room you're looking at, or the one right next door to us. Okay? Now, um, if you look in the bottom row, Near the right of center, you'll notice the emblem for SMAP, the one I just mentioned, the Soil Moisture Active Passive. So that was the last major large spacecraft we built in the room here, okay? Now, um, unfortunately, we're kind of in between phases. We don't actually have any major projects uh, going to be built in here anytime soon. The next really major thing that we're going to be building is something referred to as the 2020 rover. We have a new rover that's going to be going to Mars in 2020. And that rover is actually um, going to be mu uh, very similar to the current one we just sent, Curiosity. But the thing is, it won't launch until 2020, so it's in the design development phase right now. So they actually haven't started building the parts yet. They'll start building that sometime uh, next year. They'll probably start the preliminary building of some, uh, some parts sometime next year. So if you were to come back here, say about a year from now, you may start seeing some of the actual parts Ooh, for that fun. new rover that's going to be built for 2020, right? But right now we're in between, so we don't actually have anything major that's happening inside the room here. So, but there are some... Uh, um, engineering parts and some scale models and we do have one space uh, it's not uh, technically a spacecraft right in front of us so um, before I talk about it, let's talk about the, uh, the people though you'll notice there's a, a mannequin standing in the center of the room everybody see him yeah. that's high bay Bob uh, he's in here because sometimes we'll come in like today there's no one working so they want to give you an idea of the way people would be dressed so that's the way somebody would be dressed if they were actually working in the room and as you notice, he's, he looks kind of like a doctor or nurse working in an operating room. And the reason for that is, I mentioned earlier, the room is referred to as a clean room. The air quality is much cleaner than the air outside. And why, would, why we're regulating the, the cleanliness of the air is because when we're building a spacecraft and we're going to send it millions of miles in space, we want to do everything we can to ensure it's going to work wow. properly. Wow. And something very simple you could do to ensure mechanical things work properly, wow. you keep it clean. When mechanical, mechanical things are clean, they're more likely to work the way they're designed, less likely to malfunction and break down. Why? So that's one of the big reasons we want to keep it clean. Why? Another reason, we're sending spacecraft to places like the surface of Mars looking for possible signs of life. If you're looking for life, it's kind of important not to bring any with you. And here on Earth, there's life all over the place. And the, the actual engineers, the, our technicians and scientists that go into this room, um, we like to kind of jokingly refer to them as being biological factories making life all over them, right? Because basically we have microbes, we have germs, we have bacteria uh, even living on us. We don't want that stuff to fall off the person building that sensor that's going to be looking for life. And then you can imagine that, say, maybe he has an itch on his arm, but he doesn't take the right precaution. He doesn't wear um, like the overall, like uh, you see high bay Bob wearing, and he starts scratching his arm. Dead skin cells could fall off, land on that sensor he's building that's going to be going to Mars looking for life. And mm -hmm. the particles could be so small he doesn't notice it, it doesn't get cleaned off. 
Now you send that thing to Mars, you turn it on, and everybody gets excited because they think they found something. <laughs> but in reality, it's just a dead skill that's off the fell off the guy that built it. Yeah. So we want to be certain if we find something from Mars, it's from Mars, but the only way you can be certain, don't bring anything from Earth. So we take all these precautions to ensure our spacecraft are nice and clean. That way, when they get to wherever they're going, if they were to find something, we know it's really from there. It's not something we accidentally brought with us because we made sure that there's nothing on it, right? So now, the third reason why that's important, say there is life on Mars. Well, you don't want to introduce any kind of bacteria from Earth or anything into that environment because then next thing you know, all the life you just found, you just wiped it all out, Ooh. right? <laughs> so you want to protect that and how you do that, you make sure you don't bring anything from Earth that might adversely affect any life you might find, okay? Ooh, well, so that's why, those are some of the main reasons why we wanted to make sure our spacecraft are nice and clean. So all of our spacecraft, they're built in nice clean rooms just like what you're looking at, okay? Now, um, uh, we're, let's talk about the things oh, actually in the room. We're going to start on the right side, we'll make our way to the left, okay? So if you start on the right, there's a big giant metal box to our right. The big giant metal box, you'll notice there's a door on it. It, said, it says EMC chamber on the, on the door. This stands for Electromagnetic Compatibility Chamber. Essentially, it's a test facility, it's an isolation chamber. We like to test some of our parts, but sometimes um, a lot of things we use today, they may interfere with some of the tests we're doing. For example, when you... Um, use your cell phones, tablets, TVs, radios, a lot of the electronics we use today that we take for granted, when you turn them on, they send off radio frequencies. They can directly interfere with some of the things we're testing. And we want to be certain, when we test this spacecraft part, all the readings we're getting, it's only coming from the part we're, we're testing. The only way you can do that is you need to isolate that part. And that's what that room is used for. We could put parts in there, we could seal, the do seal it in there, so when we turn it on, we know the readings we're getting, it's only coming from the part we're testing, it's not coming from something else on the outside. So that's basically what it is. It's an isolation chamber. It's a test facility, okay? Now, if you look just to the left of it, right next to it, there's a giant bowl with a shiny bag on it. Everybody see that? Yeah. And what this is, um, this is actually the bottom half of a capsule. It's the heat shield. And specifically, that's the spare heat shield for the rover that just went to Mars three years ago. If you remember the video we saw, I talked about Curiosity. The rover you may have heard about on the news landed on Mars three years ago. That rover... Um, actually went to Mars in a little capsule. And if you remember the video we saw, as it entered the atmosphere of Mars and penetrated the upper atmosphere, the bottom half of the capsule fell off, and then exposing the rover, which then separated from the rest of the capsule. Do you guys remember that part in the video? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look to your left, that bowl you see there, that's actually the bottom half of the capsule. That's the heat shield. Now, we wanted to test the real actual one go to Mars, but if you test the actual real one go to Mars, you might damage it or you may get it dirty. So what we did was we built a spare one the same time we built the real one. It's the same size, uh, the same parts, everything about it is the same. And the thinking is if this is exactly the same and we test it, if it works, the real one will work. If we test it, it doesn't work, the real one won't work either. So we used the spare one for testing. After we did all the testing, it passed everything, it worked. We Yay. used the real thing on the real one, we sent that to Mars, it landed on Mars. Now we have a spare one sitting here. Well, I mentioned already that we, in, the, in the future we have uh, a rover we were planning to send up to Mars in 2020, and the idea is it's going to be kind of like uh, the Curiosity. It should be about the same size, it's going to be about the same weight. The only different thing about it is going to have different experiments on it, right? So the thinking is if everything stays the same and it weighs roughly about the same, guess what? It should fit in this thing. And if we use this one, we don't have to build a new one, we don't have to spend all that money on it, we don't have to test it again, we don't have to uh, spend all that money on development or everything. We already know this one works, so if it fits in this one, all we need to do is clean this thing up and we could use it on a real one, save all that money on the few, on that new mission instead, right? So that's the hope, is if everything stays the same, then there's a potential, we mm -hmm. might be able to use it as, on a new one. The problem is we haven't built it yet. It's five years away still, right? So Ooh. between now and five years from now, when they finish building it, that thing actually might end up bigger, or it might be a different mm -hmm. shape. And if anything major changes on it, guess what? It won't fit into the capsule anymore, so we can't use it. So right now, the intent is if everything works out the same, then we're going to use it. If it doesn't, then we might use this on something else in the future, okay? Now, if you look right next to it, there's another capsule right next to it over here in front of us. And um, this one, uh, it's actually a real um, technology uh, uh, development that we're trying to develop for future technologies we're using, hoping to use, to land really big things on Mars. Did anybody happen to hear on the news NASA testing a flying saucer around Hawaii earlier mid-year this year? Did anybody hear about that? If you did, you're looking at it right here. It's actually referred to as the LDSD, the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator. And this one we're looking at in front of us, this is actually the third version of it. So I shouldn't say this is the actual one that went there, because 
it was an earlier version of this that actually was the one that was tested earlier this year. If you look at the structure below it, the thing that's holding it up, it says TV3 on the left. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Test vehicle number three. So this is the third one in the series that they've been developing, right? Now what this is, we want to send humans to Mars in the future. Right now, the biggest thing we've ever sent to Mars is the rover we just talked about. The biggest, so that means the biggest heat shield we've ever used is the one that you see on the, on the right over here, right? Because that's the biggest uh, thing we sent to Mars. In the future, we want to send humans. Well, guess what? If you send humans, the things they're going to ride in, they're going to be way heavier. Now you have to figure out how do you land that way heavier thing on Mars, right? Normally, everybody just makes everything bigger. Bigger rocket, bigger heat shield, bigger everything. You make everything bigger, now you're going to spend way more money, and not to mention, it's going to be way heavier, so now you have to make even bigger rockets, use even more energy. It's even that much harder to get that thing up in space in the first place. So um, we figured, well, how can you get something heavier, but use maybe the same sort of stuff that we have right now? Uh, maybe we could use inflatables or airbags. <coughs> and what we did is basically, um, may, hopefully everyone's seen those uh, like airplane movies where an airplane crashes <coughs> and the, the, they pull out this um, uh, raft that looks like a big yellow donut. Everybody ever seen those in movies and TV shows, right? Imagine one of those, you at, attach it to the outer rim, the edge of the heat shield. And what happens is as the heat shield falls in the upper atmosphere, at the opportune moment, that thing inflates. And what happens is you get a donut-shaped ring around the edge of the heat shield. Ooh. And as it, uh, by doing that, it actually creates a larger surface area. And as you fall into the upper atmosphere, you actually catch more air, you get more drag. Now you can land bigger, heavier things on Mars without making the entire thing bigger, right? The problem is you need to <coughs> Because here on Earth, the atmosphere is thicker, so in order to get the similar atmosphere like you get on Mars, you got to fly this way up in the upper atmosphere. So they took the early version of this, the earlier ones, they attached it to a high-altitude balloon, and then they put a rocket engine in the rear end of it. They took it out to Hawaii, they released it. The balloon took it up 120,000 feet in the air, then the balloon released. The rocket engine fired. It took it up another 70,000 feet into the air, just under 200,000 feet, where it was kind of similar to the atmosphere you would get on Mars in terms of uh, thinness. Then it started, the, the rocket engine turned off, it started to fall back into the upper atmosphere. At that point, it's falling close to Mach 4. So that's four times the speed of sound, right? Um, uh, so if, for those that don't know, that's close to 3,000 miles an hour. And, and then the, the airbag would inflate, hopefully slowing it down roughly to around Mach 2. So that's twice the speed of sound, that's close to 1,500 miles an hour. And then a big parachute would pop open and it would slow it down and hopefully land it safely on the surface of uh, the Pacific Ocean. Well, the problem is um, everything worked all the way up until the point when the big parachute popped open. Because at that point, the, the spacecraft was falling close to 1,500 miles an hour. That's twice the speed of sound. That's faster than most fighter jets fly, right? And then when the parachute popped open, unfortunately, the parachute shredded. It, it was moving so fast, it couldn't slow it down. It ripped apart the parachute. And that earlier version, um, they, it did what they like to refer to as a hard landing. Right? Uh -oh. So it hit the, the Pacific Ocean. Um, unfortunately, it got damaged to the point we couldn't use it, hence the third version of the, the, the series here. And that's why you see TV3. So right now, during the process of redeveloping that parachute, they're redesigning it, they're figuring out different sewing patterns, hopefully making it stronger. And if everything works out and they're ready, they're hoping to test this one in front of us um, and do the exact same thing I just described to you in Hawaii sometime mid-year next year, sometime around June. So if you guys hear about on the news sometime next year, around summer, NASA's testing another flying saucer over there in Hawaii, you'll be able to tell all your friends and everyone you know you saw it because it's sitting right there in front of you. It's actually this one you're looking at. Cool. Okay? All right. Now, if you look right behind it, there's a solar panel. Yeah. What this is, this is actually a full-scale model of one section of solar panel for the spacecraft Juno. If you guys remember the video we just saw, it talked about a spacecraft going to Jupiter called Juno. Um, that's the spacecraft, that's the solar panel for that spacecraft. This is a full-scale engineering mm -hmm. model. So this is not, uh, never went to space. Um, but it gives you a basic idea of just how large the actual real thing is. Now, if everybody stays where you're at, just turn around real quick. Uh, the folks on this side of the room, there's actually a kind of poster board of Juno right here. And you can see it has three solar panel sections. This represents one of them. The folks on this side of the room, if you look, there's a poster board here with a picture with a kind of a silhouette of a person to give you a sense of scale. And uh, three, you can see the three sections of those solar panels. 
So this one constitutes one of those sections. So you can imagine how large the middle section would be, and then how large the other two, two solar wings would be if you had them all in here. If you actually had the whole thing in here and you opened it, it'd actually dominate the entire area of the room. It'd be huge. Right mm -hmm. now, this thing's actually been flying in space for more than five years um, on its way to Jupiter. It's supposed to make it to Jupiter next year, uh, sometime right around July 4th of next year. Right? So, if you guys hear about another spacecraft making it to Juno, uh, to Jupiter around July 4th, it's actually this one. Okay, mm -hmm. now, um, if you look on the far left over here, there's a big giant black box. It looks like there's a dumbbell sitting on it. Everybody see this thing? This is actually called a spin balance table, um, and what it's used for is. We need to make sure our spacecraft are balanced because most of our spacecraft, when they get to space, they actually spin. And when things spin, they need to be balanced properly because if you're not balanced properly, what will happen is you will wobble. And if you're really, really unbalanced, you will wobble so much, the whole thing will vibrate. You'll actually broke yourself apart, right? So we would need to make sure our spacecraft are balanced so that when they spin, they won't break apart in space. And that's how we could do it. We could put parts on there. We could spin them. We could see where the center of mass is, and we could tell if it's balanced properly, and then fix it to make sure it's balanced. That way, when it gets in the space and it starts spinning, it stays in one piece. It doesn't fall apart and start wobbling, OK? Now, um, if you look right in front of it, there's a big uh, white box to our left. That's just our shipping container for our solar panels. So they would take that whole thing apart, go in the shipping container, and that's how we get in and out of the room. Now, you may be wondering, well, how do you get the things in the room without getting the room dirty? Because we talked about how we want to keep it clean. Well, if you look to your left, there's a giant sliding garage door that opens up the giant airlock. There's an outside door, there's an inside door. And all of our spacecraft parts are put into containers, just like what you're looking at over there. And these are called flight hardware containers. They could be as small as a lunch pail, they could be the size of a semi-trailer. But it's, it's, what's so special about these, once you put the part in, you seal it, it um, their air is sealed. It doesn't let any dirty air in or out. So that's how you can get the thing in or out of the room without getting the room or the parts dirty. You just get it through the airlock in one of those containers. Okay? Did anybody have any last questions about the room? Anything I may not have talked about in the room? Anything you'd like to ask about before we go to our next talk? Any questions from anyone? Over here on the bridge that covers the expanse of the room. That's our big 15-ton crane. It lets us move wow. all the big heavy things around the room without hurting anyone. That's and cool. And you will notice. That um, is very cool. Well, actually, you can tell from a, but uh, normally when it gets closer, you'll notice underneath that it has the cardinal directions on it, north, south, east, west. And if you look in the opposite side of the room, you'll notice there's an S there, south. Uh -oh. If you look to our left, there's an E, there's for east. Uh, that's for the person operating the crane. Um, uh, it's very dangerous when you move big, heavy objects no around kidding. the room. And most people, uh, when they get directions, wow. they'll go five feet right. Well, if there's four people standing there, is it my right, this guy's right, <laughs> that guy's right, whose right is that? And if you move the, that big two-ton object the wrong direction, you may smack someone in the head and kill someone. Wow. So we want to be certain if it goes one direction, everybody in the room knows exactly which way it's going. And you do that by using the cardinal directions. You go five feet south and everybody knows it's going that way. Right? That way you're less likely to hurt somebody. Okay? Uh, any other last questions from anybody before we move on? Yeah. The black thing? That's the spin-bounce table I talked about. It's to see if...